So she came there and she came here. She's looking much, much better. God's not through with her. But I want you to know these ladies come every Sunday and practice to sing. They haven't been able to sing for a while for various reasons, but we miss them. Brother Matt kept asking me, when are they going to sing again? <laughs> and I said, well, he knows they're going to sing, so he's all excited. But they're going to sing a song, Fear Not, tomorrow. Uncertainty, questions come to my mind. What is waiting ahead for me and the rest of mankind? Fear not tomorrow, God is already there. He's charting the course you'll take. Good song, good singing, and I appreciate all that today. Well, today is Mission Sunday. Today, we are one half through our missions year this year. And uh, it's been a good year for our church mission-wise. Been able to take on nine new missionary works, and our giving is, uh, was very adequate this year. So I, I thank you uh, for that very much. And I hope that last September, when you filled out your Faith Promise Commitment card, I hope you've kept your commitment. And uh, if we'll do that, then God will use us in a great way here at this church. We've already in our church over the last 37 years given over $4 million to send missionaries around the world. Folks, that's a lot of money. And where does that come from? We're not like the government. We can't make our own money. It comes from our pockets. And so I want to say thank you so much, Liberty Baptist Church, for what you've done for missions for all these years. And, and uh, can't wait to hear today what Brother Dean Hamby is going to preach on. Brother Dean Hamby, you come on. And uh, he's the assistant director for Macedonia World Baptist Missions. And I'm very thankful to be his friend and be able to serve on the board of directors with him. And uh, there's some exciting things happening at Macedonia World Baptist Missions. Maybe he'll mention that. And uh, Brother Hamby's been a missionary, and he, now he helps to run the board. But the most thing I like about about him is he's a Tennessee Volunteers fan. Amen. So that puts him upper echelon already, okay? 
So, uh, so you, you listen up this morning. Let God, listen, let God speak to your heart today, okay, about missions. God bless you. God bless you, Brother Hammond. Yes, sir. Brother Grimes, sir. Praise the Lord. It is good to be here and go Vols. Your preacher's got orange on his watch. He's got his ink pen, his orange tie. I, I don't have anything orange on, but my heart is orange. And so um, I, did eat a, I did eat a tangerine last night, if that counts. Okay. I had some orange juice this morning. So, <laughs> But it is just exciting to be here. You know, there's three things. When I think about uh, Liberty Baptist Tabernacle, there's three things that I think um, really describe, or three words that describe who you are. And this is for all the years that I've been coming here and seeing you and, and being able to learn a little bit about you. And number one is your message. Your message is Christ. And the Word of God has never changed with you. And praise the Lord for your message. Number two is your music. I love to hear Brother Roger Perlhart lead the choir and sing. He's just easy, just so easy. And uh, you feel like you're just sitting there in a recliner and, you know, it's just so easy. But the music is right. And, boy, the ladies just uh, knocked it out of the park today. Praise the Lord for the wonderful music. And then three is your missions. And you have a church that just doesn't give. And, and I was just thinking about four million dollars. You know, some of you might say or somebody might have said, well, you know what, with that four million dollars, we could have built our building, we could have relocated, done whatever. I am persuaded to believe that had you not given that money to missions, you probably would have not, ha not had the four million dollars. God gives us to give what he will not give us to keep. But amazing four million dollars missions. But not only that, I think about the missionaries that you've sent out of the church, the church plants that you've started out of the church, but uh, what's remarkable, I was just thinking through my mind this morning that you have so many moms and dads, families that are here whose children have gone out of the church as missionaries, and you're right here in this church. And so I just think that's a remarkable thing, and praise the Lord for you. Got another family getting ready to, to get on a plane and leave, and uh, they just finished language school, and I know that you're excited about the Spear family leaving out and, and getting to Puerto Rico, and uh, praise the Lord for what he's going to do. Just a remarkable thing the Lord has done here at Liberty. And I know the great, greater days are, the greatest days are ahead for you, but I'm looking for the Lord to come back before we all get too, too old. And 41 years, I wish I was 41. Wow. Wow, that is in the rearview mirror at a long distance back, you know. <laughs> Praise the Lord, though, 41. <laughs> well, I, let me just mention, turn your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Romans, chapter number 1. Romans, chapter number 1. We were, with, uh, we were in uh, Philadelphia this past week from Saturday through Tuesday. That's how their conference ran, preaching their conference at Ben Salem Baptist Church, a great, great church. I don't know if any of you are familiar with, with Dolphus Price, but uh, Dolphus Price, Dr. Price pastor there many, many years ago, but this is just a tremendous church, uh, like your church, great music, uh, doing a great job. But the Buchanans were there. Uh, they flew up on Monday, so they were with us Monday and Tuesday night, and I think he's going to be preaching here tonight. I think that's here his wife wanted, is going to be preaching here tonight. I think that's what he told me. So, but it was good to see them and praise the Lord. But let me just mention about the mission board. It was um, pretty well known that I was being mentored uh, to take the position of general director whenever Dr. Wade stepped aside. But uh, God has blessed Dr. Wade with good health up until recent years. He's been able to uh, maintain and go. But recently his health has really faltered. And uh, he still goes and preaches, but not as much as he did. But um, Brother Scott Caudle, Dr. Caudle from Canaan Baptist Church, he felt, he came to Dr. Wade and I approached us back in October of last year. And um, let me back up just a little bit. About three years ago, I began to think about my own life, about my own ministry, about my future, where I was, and, and I began to think about my age, where I am, my health issues. So I began to think, you know, if we're going to do a transition, it needs to be a long-term thing that we're going to do at the mission board, not short-term, because I wouldn't have that many years that I would be able to serve as general director with my health and age and all. And so I began three years ago praying about that. Well, in October this past year, Dr. Caudle came to Dr. Wade and me and said three years ago he began to have a great burden about leaving Canaan and, and coming with Macedonia as the general director. He told us that in October. So we began to pray about it. 
And uh, we took, um, Dr. Wade and myself and Brother Caudill took a couple of months. We're praying about it. And boy, it was just exciting. We began to think about a man that had a burden, weren't going to go outside of the mission to find somebody, but here's a man that has a great love from Macedonia. He's never been a missionary, but he's pastored for 22 years, and he's never been not been a pastor until now. Every church he left, he came to another church straight uh, uh, without any lapse in between, uh, pastoring three churches. And so we're excited about the future. Um, I'm, I'm going to stay there. I'm going to be working with him, not going anywhere. He said, if you're going anywhere, I'm not coming. So we're not going anywhere. We're going to stay right there, going to help him and just keep, keep going on for the Lord. Excited about the future of Macedonia. So uh, we want, we, one of the things that I have a lot of people tell us about Macedonia is the stability. And, and I told the men at the board, Dr. Wade, and I know you know Dr. Wade, when you take away the emblem, the Macedonia logo, Dr. Wade's face is there behind the, the logo. He is Mr. Macedonia. But he brought to the mission board credibility and um, he brought to the mission board stability. And so we're glad for Dr. Wade and all he's done for these many years. But he's stepping aside in October, uh, September at the, at the annual conference is when the transition will take place. Dr. Wade will, uh, res will step aside as the general director. Dr. Cuddle will take that position. Dr. Wade will then become the senior international consultant and the um, general director emeritus. So we're excited about the days ahead. And uh, if he comes, though, if the Lord comes back before uh, September, then Mrs. Caudle is going to be the general director and Karen's going to be the assistant director. So if any of you are left, you'll be able to support them, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. If anybody goes, it will be two, those two. I don't know if me and Brother Caudle will make it, but those two ladies will absolutely make it. Romans chapter number one, I appreciate a mission Sunday. I know I'm here preaching to the choir. You give and you go. It's not trying to Pump and prime people will give your money, or pump and prime people give your children. You already do that. So I'm just here, John, to encourage you in some things of the Lord that we find in Romans chapter number one. I love the book of Romans. What a great, cha what a great book where we have so many of the truths of the gospel unveiled to us. It is just amazing. The plan of redemption, how God grafted in the Gentiles. And I, we may ha have some Jewish people here today. I'm not sure. But most of us, I think, are Gentiles. And, and um, we've been grafted into the Lord. And just an amazing, amazing thing that we have. And and uh, Romans chapter 10, verse number 13, I'll mention in a little while, is my verse of Scripture. And praise the Lord for this book of Romans. So let's read. And let me, let's do this. Let's just have you stand for a moment. That'll honor the Word of God. Also give you a chance to uh, g give those padded pews some relief. They're just sitting there. The pews are groaning and moaning under your weight. And so uh, let me give you just a moment for that. Verse number 8, we'll begin there. The Bible says, First I thank my God through, Je for, through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long, I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. Some people say that's the, the ladies who aren't married's verse of Scripture. I would not have you ignorant, brethren. Okay? I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I'm debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, excuse me, ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and the truth of your word that we have and hold your truth near and dear to us. And Father, now as we stand here and we think about a mission Sunday just before Resurrection Sunday next week, we thank you that we have a risen Savior, and we're not preaching uh, a religion, we're not preaching uh, a 
um, some kind of a foundation, but we're preaching a, a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you for your word. Pray you'll bless it to our hearts today. And we'll bless you and praise you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. This morning, by way of introduction, I'm actually going to use my first two points as my introduction, and then we're going to actually bear down on the last point, and it is right now about 17 before 12, and as I always say here at your church, I, we will be out and done by 12 o'clock Alabama time. I was preaching in Alabama, and I said that, and I, come and, and, and I thought, I am in Alabama. Where do we go from here? So I said, well, whatever. We'll be done before 12 o'clock somewhere sometime. But anyway, let me, let me share uh, these thoughts with you, and, uh, but uh, mention first of my first two points, and then we'll get into the main meat of the message. Paul said, I am ready. This word ready, it means passion, to go forward in passion. The, the root word, the root Greek word for this word passion, or, or for ready, it is the word passion, passion. So Paul, when he said he was ready, it wasn't like a man that is, or I shouldn't say a man, I should just say me. Here, I, and I'm waiting for Karen to get ready, you know, ready, and I'm waiting, and are you ready yet? And I'm waiting impatiently. It's not that kind of a ready. This means you have a burning desire in your soul to do something. It's a man like Nehemiah that God put a burning desire in his, in his soul to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. It's that burning desire that you find in a man by the name of Moses that went into Egypt to lead the people of God out. It's that burning desire that Joseph had to please his father to go look for his brothers that eventually led him into captivity into Egypt for a time before he was exalted to the to second in command of Egypt. It is that burning passion that he had in his soul to go to Rome, to go to Rome. Now, first of all, Paul was ready. He had a burning passion. He had a, he had a drive in his soul to go to Rome in, in light of or in, in hopes of the gain that he would see at Rome. And you see it in these verses of Scripture. The first part of it is in verse number 13, so that he might have some fruit among them, some fruit. Now, Paul wasn't foolish to think that he would be able to go to Rome and win everybody in Rome. He said some fruit. So it's not everybody you witness to. It's not everybody that you give a tract to. It's not everybody you pray for that will be saved. But here's the good news. The Word of God has promised that if we sow we shall also reap. That is a promise of the word of God. So Paul said, I am ready to go, in verse number 13, to have some fruit among you also. So listen, we can't win everybody, but we can win some. We can't give everything, but we can give some. We can't do everything, but we can do something. So that ought to be our heart's desire. Number two, Paul then said that he was ready to go to Rome in spite of the grief that he would suffer. The grief that he would suffer. Now, you've got to remember, everywhere Paul went, he suffered persecution. He, you know, Paul just, just didn't have one shipwreck. He had three shipwrecks. He was beaten. He was stoned. He was stoned and left for dead. As a matter of fact, I believe he literally did die. Everywhere Paul went, his home was usually in the prison cell. Persecution followed him everywhere he went. But here's Paul. That burning passion, had it, been, had it been Dean Hamby, I'm allergic to pain. It hurts. I don't like it. I'm a baby. My wife will tell you that I, anybody, she's got a pain tolerance of 125 gazillion. I've got a pain tolerance of nothing. And I, go, I don't like pain. But let me tell you something. The passion in Paul's heart was driving him to go to Rome driving him, passion, I'm ready. And you think about wherever he went, he had this persecution, he had all these problems, he ran into all these things, idolatry, and everywhere he went. But listen, do you know where it came from? Rome was the center of the known world. And, the, and they say that all roads, in that day, all roads led to Rome from the, all the known world. But can I tell you, from Rome, emanated, from Rome, went out, the wickedness and degradation. If you can imagine a place that was the vilest place on earth, it was Rome. People go today, they go to the Roman, they go to Rome in order to see the sites and all the things. And there are a lot of interesting things in Rome, the aqueducts and all the things. But there is one place that people just love to go see, and it's called the Colosseum. You know what the Colosseum was used for? 
it wasn't a football stadium or a soccer stadium. It wasn't a place, it wasn't a place for normal entertainment. It was a place for the vilest entertainment that a man could ever imagine. And that was that human blood would be shed and they would round up all these Christians and who was, a, who, who was a, the off-scouring of society. I mean, they were the scum of the earth and they would bring all these Christians into the arena of the Colosseum and there they would, they would unleash on them these wild animals or these gladiators and these people and there at, at, at the whim of Nero and of the emperors of Rome, they would put all these Christians to death. It was Nero actually that was there when Paul went to Rome eventually, he would take Christians and burn them alive at the stake and he would skin them alive and use his, their skins for shades and all sorts of things. He would light his garden with the burning of Christians. This is where Paul was being driven to go. But in spite of that, you know why? Because as all of the wickedness would flow from Rome, he also knew that the gospel could flow from, Ro from Rome so if I could just go there to Rome, and if I could see somebody saved. And it was that burning desire. And you know who controlled it? I, love, I don't have time to get into all this. But he says in verse number 13, but was led hither too. He was hindered from going, and it was the Holy Spirit that hindered him. I know it, I, don't, I don't know about you, but I go to mission conferences, and I see the presentations and hear the testimonies, and I want to go everywhere. But after the conference is over, you know, I get back to reality. But you know, with Paul, this wasn't just a whim. It wasn't just a passing emotion. This was burnt into his heart by God himself. And it was driven, but it was the Holy Spirit because it's, the will of God involves what I should do, but it also involves when. But it was God that was burning and driving him, and he was ready to go in spite of the grief that he would suffer. Then last of all, and this, let me, this is what I want to get into for just a few moments, that Paul was ready to go to Rome in light of the gospel that he would preach. There are three, from verse number 14 down to verse 16, in those three verses of Scripture, there are three I am's that are listed there. This thing, this thing of missions was personal to Paul. I could ask the families in your church, well, I, you know, I could ask all of you, and you have a desire to give to missions or you wouldn't give. But I could ask the families in this church, and I'm looking at some now, this is personal. This thing of missions is personal with them. They've got a son, they've got a daughter, and that's okay, but they've got grandchildren. That is where it really counts. They've got children that have sacrificed their lives. They've left mom and dad and the comforts of, their, of where they know is real and good, and they've ventured out, and there they're trying to serve God and win people to God, and it was, it's personal to them. And this friend was personal to Paul. And I believe if we do anything for God, it ought to be personal. He's a personal Savior. Everything ought to be my relationship to Him. And so Paul says, I am. Let's get into it. Let's, let's begin. I'm going to skip verse 14 for, and go to verse number 15. And he says, so much as in me is. And here's a little Jew that wasn't, he, he was eaten up inside and out with God with the will of God, with the burden of people. He was just consumed with it. As much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. So let me give you three things. Number one, Paul was ready to go to Rome because he had experienced the gospel. I, I, you know, there's some people that could, you know, I don't need a lot of stuff. I don't need things, but there's some people can just sell stuff. They just sell stuff. I don't need the stuff, but they could sell it. Me, I couldn't sell a heater to an Eskimo. I couldn't sell ice to somebody living on the equator. You know, I'm just not a salesman. But I want you to know that Paul preached the gospel because he had experienced the gospel. I'm glad today, you know who God uses to, to, to spread the gospel? God uses people like you and me. And by the way, I didn't mention this, but here you got two, two Tennessee guys up here on the platform. And I love this. When, I, when the choir was up here, there wasn't anybody five rows back. I thought, you know what? With, with Brother Pearl Hart leading the singing 
and, and Brother Grimes doing the preaching, that is your spitting area. You know, you don't want to sit any too close. And I still see we got two or three seats here. We can, I still got a good spitting range, you know. But you know who God uses? He uses people that have been saved by the grace of God. He could use angels if he wanted to. God could use donkeys, and I've heard some guys I thought maybe God was using them. But anyway, uh, God, can, God could have done whatever God wanted to do to spread the gospel. He could have written it in the clouds of, and in the heavens. God could have done what God wanted to do, but God chose to use people like me and you who have experienced the gospel. I think about, let me give you four little things here. I got fours and threes all over. I just throw these numbers out. I probably don't even have but one or two. But anyway, let me give you two or three or four. Number one, Paul had experienced the wooing of the Spirit that preaching the gospel brings. You remember the day you really understood? I don't care how old you were, how young you were. Do you remember the day you really understood the gospel? And the Holy Spirit took that word of God and he began to woo you. Now, I know you young folks, you have no clue what wooing is, do you? Okay, you, I, I, I knew you didn't, so I'm going to explain it to you. Before my wife and I got married, I had hair, by the way. I was about, I was about 160 pounds. That, that's the reason I, it looked like I had hair. I probably didn't have any more than I got now, but when you're smaller, your, your head gets smaller and your hair comes together. Oh, anyway... Um, when Karen, before we, I, man, she was just, oh, knockout gorgeous, you know, and here I am, knockout ugly, and, but I'm going to woo her, I'm going to draw her, I'm going to try to win her, so I go in there, and I take that one hair, and I pull that thing up, and I spray that rascal down real good, you know, and I twirl him up, and make him just right, you know, and so I do my best to look the best I can, and so I would only go out with her at night, and I wore, I, I, and I used the flashlight, and she didn't have a light. So it wasn't until afterwards that we got married. I have a good joke right there, but I won't tell it. But anyway, I was wooing her, you know, send her flowers and candy and buy her little things, and I was, woo, I was drawing her to me, okay? But that's what the gospel does. The Holy Ghost of God takes that book and he begins to, he, he tells us through the word of God that we're, we are a sinner and we deserve to go to hell. Not just going to hell, but deserve to go to hell. You know, deserve it. We deserve it. We're sinners. We deserve it. But in that same gospel, I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit of God says, you don't have to go to hell. You don't have to go. There's somebody that died on the cross that, that paid that, that precious price through his blood on the cross of Calvary, and you don't have to go. God loves you so much. He sent his only begotten son to the world, and he says you don't have to go. And man, he begins to woo you. I'm telling you, he, he begins to share with us who he is. It's just like when, when the servant of Abraham went over there and he, he met Rebecca and he began, and, and through the servant, he began to woo Rebecca for Isaac. And he gave her those jewels and all those things. He began, began to tell the, Rebecca about the father's house and all that there was at the father's house. And man, he said, will you go? And she said, I sure will. And jumped on that camel and here they went. Can I tell you, I'm glad that we experienced, we who are saved, we have experienced the wooing of the Spirit of God. Ah, oh, listen, but not just the wooing of the Spirit of God that preaching brings, but we also experience the weight of sin that uh, conviction brings, the weight of sin. Oh, listen, can I tell you, the day that I got saved, I'm going to tell you there was a load lifted off of me. Amen. That guilt of my sin and all that I had done, I was only 18 years old, but can I tell you, an 18-year-old can get into a lot of stuff. But it doesn't matter how much stuff you've been in or how much stuff you haven't been in, we're all born sinners. And, the, and, that, and that gospel comes and then all of a sudden conviction comes and the night that I heard the gospel and understood, I should say understood the gospel as a 17-year-old, a whole year went by before I was saved, but one whole year, you talking about under conviction and that weight, that guilt, that load. I, I, I mentioned this, you know there's a, every, every vehicle you buy, a bicycle, whatever, there's a weight limit. They test it and there's a weight limit that goes with every vehicle. And you know what the weight limit is? 
for, for a man that God made us for the guilt of sin and the burden of sin and the burdens of life. You know what the weight limit is? Because if you, if you surpass the weight limit of a vehicle, eventually it's going to break down because it wasn't built to carry the weight that you've tried to put in it. Can I tell you what the weight limit is for me and you today? Zero. God didn't build man to, or he didn't create man to carry any, any, any load or any weight or any guilt, any problems, any burdens, but man in his sin has brought upon himself all these burdens, all but conviction, all but then. Aren't you glad that Paul experienced the glory, the glory that comes when you get saved by the grace of God? And isn't it wonderful when the grace of God comes and all of a sudden you're saved by the wonderful, marvelous grace and you experience what it is to have that load and that guilt taken away and aren't you glad for what God does, what God does. And then Paul experienced the wonder, the wonder of living for Christ. Just every day, the wonder. Listen, you know what? I'm, I'm a, well, I got two of them behind me. We're just a bunch of hicks from Tennessee. But isn't it amazing the wonder that living for the Lord brings when you just live for him? It's just an exciting life. So Paul, he experienced the gospel. Number two, Paul explored the gospel. He explored it. This is an amazing thing in itself. Paul, um, he uses the word in, in, chapter, uh, in verse number 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He explored the gospel. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. This word ashamed is used five times in the book of Romans. One time it's used just ashamed to, do with, to, to, to deal with um, the shame of a person's past life. The other four times it's used just like this, not ashamed. It's used three times. It talks about my relationship to him the day that I got saved. I wasn't ashamed. I wasn't ashamed. He saved me. But here he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. This word ashamed literally means to be disfigured. That's why when Karen and I were dating, I carried the flashlight. You know, I didn't want her to see this, you know, this mess. But isn't it true that a person that's maybe been in an accident, an automobile accident or a fire and their face has become disfigured, they don't like for people to stare at them, to look at them. And so they kind of hold their head down. And this is what this word is. You, you hide yourself. You hold your head down. But here's what Paul did. I love this. When Paul began to explore the gospel, and he never reached the ends of exploring because it's a, it's a mine with hidden treasure. It's a mine with endless treasure. But as he began to explore the gospel, here's what he found. He didn't have to hold his head down in shame. He could lift his head up because this is real. It was, it's not man-made. It wasn't made over in a corner somewhere where people got together and figured out a new religion. Can I tell you, this is God-made. This is glory-made. And can I tell you, it's so perfect, perfectly designed that God hasn't had to change it. It's always been by the grace of God. And I'm glad the plan of God never changed as, man, as time went along and as man, as man went along and as he, as he you know, with his inventions and all the things, I'm glad that this gospel still works today. I'm glad that this gospel is still for everyone today. It doesn't matter how cultured or how uncultured. It doesn't matter how rich, how poor. It doesn't matter what culture we live in. I'm glad that this gospel works today. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Not ashamed. Dr. Robertson had on his, when Dr. Robertson was pastor at Highland Park Baptist Church, every day he had gospel dynamite. Can I tell you, I'm so glad that Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The word power has a twofold meaning. First of all, the word power in the Greek, it, it speaks of a word that we use in English called dynamite. I'm so glad that the word of God is able to come to a hard, the hard heart of a person and blast that heart. Break up that heart. Shatter that heart. Make that heart. Can I tell you, everybody here has got a hard heart, a wicked heart before a holy God. But I'm glad the gospel message, it breaks that heart. But it's not just 
It's not just breaking that heart up. I'm glad it's not just dynamite. I'm glad it's a dynamo. Karen and I had the privilege of going to the Hoover Dam out in, out in uh, Nevada, and that's one, I tell you, it is an amazing thing to see. And down inside of that Hoover Dam, they've got these big dynamos and these generators that are running. But you know what it's doing? It's converting power to power. It is. It's taking water power, and it's converting it to electrical power. Can I tell you, aren't you glad what God did when the Holy Ghost power came into our life and converted this old wicked sinner, this old wicked heart, and transformed us into power that God can use to reach a wicked world? God did that. The conversion of a man. And Paul explored the gospel and found the power, but he also found in the gospel promises, precious promises. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God into salvation. Look at this now to everyone that believeth. Do you know today that the promise of the gospel is that it's for everybody? God doesn't have these, these poor old teenagers over here selected. Okay, you got to go to hell. You get to go to heaven. You got to go. I, I'm so glad that every teenager over here, in spite of their ugly looks for the guys and the beautiful looks for the girls, aren't you glad? <laughs> There's amen. They have been unemotional until just then. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but aren't you glad it's for whosoever will? That's what the Word of God says. You go on down to verse number 18, and you'll also find there that, well, verse 17 talks about how that it's revealed, the, the righteousness of God is revealed through the gospel to everyone. But in verse number 18, we also find the wrath of God is revealed. Did you know the promises of God are not all just good toward us? There's some promises that God has made that are for man's condemnation. You're going to, a person will die and go to hell because you're a sinner. And God said, it is so. God keeps his word. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But if a person doesn't get saved, hell awaits that person. And it's a promise. The wrath of God is revealed. revealed. So he experienced the gospel. He explored the gospel. Um... But as you go down through these verses of Scripture, I want you to notice, last of all, that Paul, he executed the gospel. Executed the gospel. Paul says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are to Rome also. He executed the gospel. Now, there's something interesting about that. Would you look with me in verse number 17? For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as is written, the just shall live by faith. Have you ever noticed this expression, faith to faith, faith to faith? I've had a hard time trying to figure out that expression, faith to faith, faith to faith. Here's what I believe it means. I believe, number one, it talks about the faith. The Word of God tell, calls itself the faith, the faith. A person cannot be saved apart from the Word of God, the gospel. Impossible. You can't look at a tree and say, okay, I believe in Christ. Um, you, you, now, we know through creation there is, a, there is a God, but we don't know anything about him. But the gospel brings it down to where we live, and we understand. So the Word of God is faith, the, the faith. But from faith to faith, what the Word of God does in a person's heart when a person is, is lost and the gospel comes to him and that desire, that want to be saved comes. You know where the faith comes to believe? It comes from the word of God. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So from the faith to faith, a person is saved from the gospel by the foolishness of preaching. Whether it's a track or on the radio or in a pulpit or in order, whatever, it's the word of God. But it's not just, I don't believe it's just from faith to faith. I believe the faith speaks also of me and of you if you're saved. We have faith in Christ. And so from us, the, from us who are saved, who have faith, taking the gospel to those who don't have any faith, who aren't saved, so that they can have faith. So we have from faith to faith, from the word of God to the sinner. Then we have our scriptures to sinner. And then we have from the saints to the sinner, from faith to faith. We take it. So Paul experienced, so let's go to verse number 14. He says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. The barbarian side is over here if anybody wants to know. This little section right down here, the barbarians. <laughs> to the wise, to the unwise, you know. But no. Oh, I, kids, I'm, don't, I'm young folks, I'm just 
picking at you because I wish I was young enough to sit with you. But anyway, so be it. Um, he said, I am debtor. I am debtor. Of course, that word debtor doesn't... Has anybody here... Has anybody here... Uh, or I should even say, does anybody or has anybody ever owed a debt? Raise your hand. All right. Okay. I, I got in debt one time with my son. He was about 16 and a half years old or so, and he, he was working at Walmart. I, I was broker and a convict, and I said, Jason, can I borrow $5? He said, don't forget to pay me back. I said, don't forget to pay you back. That's what I, I said. Don't forget to pay you back. You've been living in my house for over 16 years free. <laughs> Uh, and don't forget to pay you back. But anyway, uh, I did pay him back because I didn't want to, you know, nah, I did pay him back. But, you know, it's not wrong to have a debt and as long as you pay your debt, okay, as long as you're current on your debt. That's not the word. This word, I am debtor, literally means one who is delinquent. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but has anybody ever been delinquent on a debt? You know, you didn't, you didn't just forgot about something, didn't pay it, or you just didn't pay it. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They don't care about why you didn't do it. They just know you didn't do it. Has anybody ever been delinquent? This is the word. Paul said, I am there. And this word, I am, this is a present state of being for Paul. But here's the deal. He didn't say, I am a debtor. If he had put the little article, the little word A there, I am a debtor, it could mean one of two things, possibly. Number one, it, it could mean this is a temporary situation. I'm a debtor today, but I'm not a debtor tomorrow because I paid my debt off. Did you know that Paul never, ever felt he had paid his debt? Never, never, until you come to Romans, or excuse me, Second Timothy chapter number 2, somewhere around verse number 6, and he changes his ready. Here he's ready to go to Rome, but there he changes his ready. Mm. Think about it. For I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Then he goes on to say, I fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. I believe it's then and only then that Paul felt his debt had been paid. Think about all the people he had led to the Lord, all the people he preached to, all the persecution he suffered, all the place he went. It's because Paul was driven because he owed a debt. He didn't say, I am a debtor, because it was not a temporary situation with Paul. He was for always delinquent. Number two, he didn't say, I am a debtor, because that can also mean that there are other people that are debtors too. I'm just one of many. I'm, I'm a debtor. You're a debtor. We're all debtors. Paul didn't look, like, look at it like, I'm a debtor. You're a debtor. He said, I am debtor. But here's why Paul said that, I believe. Whether you pay your debt or not, I still owe my debt. Whether I've reached a certain age or not, I still owe my debt. I'm a debtor. I'm debtor. I'm, de I'm always debtor. I'm always, I always, I'm always owing it. And it's my responsibility, whether you do anything or not, I still got to do it. I'm debtor. So Paul executed the gospel on his own. How about you this morning? Are you doing anything to get anybody saved? Are you giving any money to your faith promise? Are you giving out tracts? Are you witness? Are you doing anything? Number two, is there going to be anybody in heaven because you did something to help get them there? I don't know what it's going to be like. I don't know. You know, there's songs written, Dreamed I Went to Heaven. There's a lot of songs about it. I don't know what it's going to be like, but could it be just like the song that somebody will come up to you and say, it, it's, thank you for what you did. Amen. It's because of you. I got a feeling that the judgment seat of Christ is all going to come out. All going to come out. Have you done anything? But here's my third question. You may be here today and you've never been saved. You've never experienced that wooing of the Spirit. You may have never have ever experienced that weight that conviction brings. You've never experienced that glorious wonder of coming to Christ. And boy, we sure would invite you today to come and receive Him.
Let's stand to our feet. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. I'm going to pray, and then your preacher is going to come with the invitation.